Uh, thank you, Noga, and uh, thanks everybody for coming. I know the, top, the, the, the title talk, talks about the law, so I assume there are also people here who are not necessarily computer scientists, and I'll try to make the talk accessible to all of them. But I want to first of all say something to Christos. I agree with you on one thing, but I disagree with another thing. So I agree with you completely about the Berkeley Hills. <laughs> that when you stand there and you see the view, you think to yourself, wow. I mean, it's every day, you know, except when it's foggy, which is like three quarters of the time. But, but, <laughs> but, 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 uh, but the other thing I disagree with you about the animals talking. And there is actually going to be a workshop in, uh, in, uh, at Simon's. I disagree with many people. That's, that's fine. Uh, that's better. Uh, but in any case, I, I think that there's actually evidence of the fact that they do communicate and we go beyond uh, dolphins and sperms, bees, and sperm bees, whales. Bees, bees done. So that's a really great question. And uh, in any case, there'll be a workshop on, uh, it's a bunch of marine biologists and machine learning people trying to determine whether there is a, a language aspect to the communication. And uh, also there's a woman who's going to, uh, a, a professor, Lilach Adani, who's going to speak on Wednesday, I think, about evolution. But she has some very interesting papers about plants, listening and talking. Now, whether it's language or not is a different question also how we define language and what's the purpose of it. But I, I, so I, I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> in any case, no, no, I mean, I, I'm, who knows? Okay, so this talk is about, um, I, so I've modified a little further than algorithms and the law. It's more about cryptography, um, or cryptographic uh, type of research in, in the law. And I want to thank a lot of people who've helped me with this talk, because again, it's not my, my expertise. Kenneth Bamberger uh, from the law school at Berkeley, uh, Ran Canetti from BU, Aloni Cohen, who is now in BU, he used to be my student, Frank Partnoy from Berkeley uh, Law, Yonanda Shavit, uh, my son, who's doing a, a, a grad student in, at Harvard, uh, Mayang Varya from BU, Prasad, <laughs> a, 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 I, can't put it, Prashant, I can't pronounce the, the last name, and Daniel Weitzner uh, from MIT. Okay, so, um, so first of all, what about my personal journey here into law and algorithms? It's really been because I moved from uh, uh, Boston to, to Berkeley, and I wanted to keep in touch with people in, uh, in Boston in particular in, uh, uh, after a year at Radcliffe, and we decided that we're going to uh, teach a class that had sort of lawyers in it and computer scientists in it. And uh, we we're going to do it on video. So half the students were sitting in Berkeley, half the students were sitting in Boston. We were giving lectures across. So we had faculty who were both computer scientists and, and law people, and the orange people are the law people, and uh, blue people are computer science. And we've ran it twice, once uh, uh, fall 2018, and the other one finished fall 2019 and in addition there was a course that's being taught at MIT almost every year from for, for a long time about uh, privacy in the law sort of privacy from the computer science uh, perspective a, and by Danny Weitzner who, who is both in Georgia Georgetown uh, Law School and also he um, works at MIT lectures at MIT and all these students were either students of mine or my son and they've taught me a lot so the truth is that this is really Mikolle because really this, my students have, uh, never mind for those who don't know what that means, but essentially it means that my students have taught me everything here um, and, and I'm presenting it. So what were the lessons learned from this journey into uh, teaching this uh, law class? So I guess the biggest lesson is probably something we could have guessed to begin with, but it became very, very apparent, is that there's a huge language barrier. And it's even bigger because we kind of speak, we all speak English, um, to some extent, and, uh, and the thing is we use the same words to mean something completely different. So when the lawyers uh, or the judges talk about proof in court or evidence, it means something completely different than we talk about proof, and mostly uh, in the sense that it's not defined, and uh, there is some, some, some definitions, some guidelines, but it certainly doesn't have a you know, probability distribution, talking about high probability and low probability and what the space is. Uh, similarly, um, when you talk about probabilities, that's another big one. When you talk without, without, uh, beyond reasonable doubt or, uh, or, or the, the different parts of law require a different type of certainty. Again, when we talk about probabilities, we have to be very precise and we have to, you know, it's very clear what the probability means, what the probability space is. And there are many such, and there's many such uh, uh, cases. And uh, there's also a knowledge barrier. Like we don't know enough what the spirit of the law, uh, why a law was written a certain way, what is the intent. Often the intent is actually to be vague and to be able to interpret it, and they don't know uh, what we can offer. 
I think that's a, that's a big one, that there is a lot of things that have been developed in, in, in computer science besides you know, running an algorithm that, you know, that's you know, over Google and you know, fundamental technologies that nobody seems to me outside of our field knows, but that could be actually interesting to use in the context of, of legal procedures. So I do think that the interdisciplinary effort is, is, is necessary here uh, because there's an opportunity. Um, okay, so that's kind of the big lesson. And I would say that uh, a lot of people talk about uh, law for governing algorithms because we know now there's algorithms for setting bail and deciding whether you are allowed to get a mortgage or uh, policing. There's a lot of hype about that and it's not just hype, it's for real. In California now they have this bail, um, uh, no bail it has to be decided. It's not, not cash bail anymore, but just whether you give somebody bail or not it has to be decided by an algorithm. There's a lot of money out there for companies to implement such algorithm, a lot of money for companies to scrutinize those companies that implement the algorithm. It's all supposed to be black box. So there's a lot of discussion about the first, but I want to talk about the second, which is kind of the reverse direction. So not law for governing algorithms, but more algorithms, not really for governing, but maybe for, in some sense for governing and implementing law. And not just algorithms, but also uh, maybe the emphasis even more is on formal definitions uh, for law and regulations. Yeah. Okay, so for governing algorithms. I th what I meant by. Yeah, yeah. What I, right. Law My caller is called law and algorithms. I don't know what it's called for real, but it, what it should be called. Ah, okay, I'm sorry then. I think law, it probably was. So I think the meaning, uh, uh, not that I think, the meaning that, my meaning when I wrote this sentence, law for governing algorithms, is now there are gonna be these algorithms and somebody has to say how they can be used, what's reasonable to use them for, what's not reasonable to use them for, uh, you know, within different uh, settings, like courts or banks and so forth. That's what I meant. Uh, um, Right, so, uh, what do I mean? <laughs> We're gonna not, uh, <laughs> uh, I will speak of specific algorithms and then there will not be any question of what do I mean. Okay, because it's of course too wide a word to use. All right, so the outline of the talk will be sort of a taste of three directions that I can, I think that we have something to say. One is really uh, definitions, as I said. So we have a, a lot of experience, especially I think as a cryptographer, we've spent many, many years, you know, 40 years or so, uh, spending time on trying to formalize what an adversary is, trying to formalize what uh, security means in many contexts like encryption and digital signatures and protocols. And I think that this uh, ability can translate also to this legal <laughs> arena, and I'll show you an example. In particular, uh, I'll give you sort of a crypto style definition for something called the right to be forgotten, which is uh, um, a, a part of a regulation uh, called GDPR. So this is the European law for privacy. And uh, there's some statements in English there of what they expect um, big companies to do, big data collectors. And part of them uh, talk about this right to be forgotten. I'll explain more what that means. And then the second part of the talk, or the middle part of the talk, will be, uh, so we'll move away from definitions, and I'll show you that even some existing cryptographic techniques, in my opinion, like uh, multiply computation and zero knowledge, which I really give just one minute definitions for people who haven't seen this before, who are not from computer science, um, that they have, in my opinion, some potential. Of course, this would require codifying uh, regulations in, in, in an algorithmic way, and it would require the agreement of legal scholars that this um, has value. But I, I, in my opinion, there is a potential there. And then finally, there's, if we get to it, there's sort of a case in point. In other words, that we, this has actually been built is, it, with this. There is a certain a system that we built that, it, uh, that is supposed to um, enforce uh, accountability in, the judicial, in surveillance. Okay, so it's a prototype, it's a conference paper that appeared in Usenix, so obviously it's not a, a system, but it responded to something that was raised by a judge, and it was uh, viewed, reviewed by him, and um, who knows, you know, if these kind of things improved, I'm sure, ten times fold, um, be used in practice. Okay, so there'll be sort of three parts. So first of all, about this uh, right to be forgotten. Uh, so this is sort of the obligatory style on the uh, slide, 
And that is that we know that uh, there's a lot of data that's being collected, and this is enormous potential in many, many different subfields uh, in health, in disease control, in finance, infrastructure, obviously vision, natural language understanding. Also these days people talk, especially in the context of people worried about social uh, issues, uh, policing, bail, credit rating. That we're going to use algorithms to replace uh, decisions that were previously done by, by humans. And obviously, these algorithms are going to be based on data from the past. And uh, in addition to that, as I understand it from my colleagues who admit this freely, these algorithms do miraculous things, but nobody really can explain why. And some of these uh, things, like policing and bail and credit, you know, require explainability, because you'd like, somebody would like to know how to improve the situation, their ability to receive a loan. I think even legally speaking, they're required to be able to approve the situation. Okay, so we know that data is important. We know that this means that those companies who hold data have now a lot of power. And uh, it is, if it doesn't worry people, then they're plain stupid because, you know, it's a complete change of reality and we don't necessarily have to assume that that's um, gonna result in better life than we have already. Not that it's that good, but in any case, <laughs> it's not clear it's gonna be better. But, um, so there are these bodies of regulations. Um, this uh, GDPR is the thing I mentioned before. This is the European uh, body of uh, policy and regulation. It talks about um, what's sensitive information, what's uh, identifying information. Um, a, there's fines if you violate some of the things that they require, like not being able to single out users and so forth. And there's also California law. This is the California Uh, no, but the first C. Uh, maybe it's something Protection Act. Yeah. Very good. California Consumer Privacy Act. Um, and it's quite similar, but a little bit different uh, here and there. And the que one of the questions, uh, one of the sort of big, uh, I think, reason why companies are worried about it is that they impose very large penalties. So it's not anymore a small penalty that doesn't concern anybody. It always reminds me about it in Israel on Shabbat, right? There's these stores that are open and they don't really care if they get fined because it's certainly worth to be open. Here they're gonna fine in a serious uh, fashion. So it actually is concerning. But one of the clear question here is, it's not even clear how, they, how does a company who is well-intended in the sense that doesn't wanna be fined and wants to be diligent, how do they know they're even compliant? Because the law is very, very informal. You know, there's a question of making an effort. Also, there's uh, wording says you have to show that you've made an effort. What does it me mean to make an effort? What does it mean to make an effort that results in compliance? Uh, that seems to uh, right away require uh, a definition. Okay, so the part of that, uh, so this is not something that I, uh, that we came up with, but it's the first time, I mean, this intent is the first time it was by a, I think a, Benny, a, a Kobe Nisim, sorry, uh, was really the, it's a joke for, um, okay, so, um, a, <laughs> so they brought up this question about formalizing the, the GDPR notion of singling out, and, um, and uh, they have a beautiful paper that has a definition for what does it mean to single out, and really the idea there is, the intuitive first definition is that you cannot find a predicate on, the on a public database that only is true for one, one line. But you, know, you can't satisfy that because a random predicate would satisfy, <laughs> that could be true for it. So they have to kind of uh, set the bar to be you know, beyond that. So random predicate obviously uh, you can't fight against it, but can you ensure that you can't do better than that? Uh, but what we are doing in this paper with uh, Sanjam and Prashant, is uh, talk about a different part of the law, not about singling out, but this right to, to be forgotten. So what do I, um, so let me tell you a little bit about this, as much as I know about it. So there was a case in Spain, uh, I think seven, eight years ago, where there's a Spanish uh, citizen um, who uh, sued Google Spain, because he said that there, when they Google him, some information about him uh, faulting on a loan uh, 15 years before comes up. Um, and he said that he, uh, or his house was up for um, collection, um, and, and, and he said that he's already made good on this, and this information shouldn't come up because it hampers his business opportunities and so forth. It was a whole court case, and he won, 
actually. And when you use Google in Spain, you're not allowed to, because he asked it to be removed, you're not allowed, that information should not come up. And there's a whole big question of whether this is also true of Google in the US, because he's a Spanish citizen, let's say in the US, should it come up or not? Never mind. The issue is, this is just an, an example, that this has been tested in a sense, this request from Google to remove information about you, and it's been found in, in favor of the plaintiff. Um, but the, obviously the, the, the regulation in, in GDPR is, is the wider than that. It doesn't talk just about search in a Google engine, and, and it doesn't talk about something that happened 15 years in the past or something that should be removed. It's bigger and vaguer. Um, in the sense of what things are, uh, <coughs> what is your right to give consent to your information? How do you give this, take away this consent? And what should these companies do in, in such a case? And um, essentially, there's a divide here. On one side, there's these data privacy laws, like these regulations, and they talk about right to be erasure or right to be forgotten, and they use uh, words. We'll talk about this a little bit more. And the other side, there's sort of us who are supposed to, uh, who, who know a lot about data privacy techniques. This is, a lot of my slides are bored from, with permission, this is from Aloni. Uh, so there's a lot of data privacy techniques on encryption, multi-party computation, obfuscation, pseudonymization, lots of things. But the question is, how do these things actually uh, talk to each other? I mean, do, do we have anything to, do they have anything in common? Can we use them? Uh, in a minute, it will become, I think, clear why this is relevant, actually, to this forgotten business. For example, if something is encrypted in some, you know, intuitively, in some sense, you have, and there's no key, you can think of that as erasure, yeah? Um, so the question is whether these techniques of ours satisfy the law enough, okay? Of course, how can you answer that if you don't have a definition of the law? So the first step here would be to, um, well, this is the test case sorry, I didn't, uh, that I mentioned before. It's coming a little later about EU court backs right to be forgotten. Google must amend results on request. So you, um, um, I just here wanted to mention before I go to how we define this, is to say that the Google search was not the only example. Another example, if you think about it, where you want to be forgotten is, let's say, in life insurance. You want to get life insurance. Maybe you were extremely ill uh, 20 years ago, but it's all been uh, fixed. Uh, you're not going to get life insurance if they can find out this detail. And maybe even when it says that you're not supposed to admit it on a form because there is some regulation that says um, that you're not bound to, to, to report it. Another uh, idea, another place which is kind of obvious is if you've committed a crime, let's say in the past, and uh, they can find out that you committed a crime. Or if you are a minor and you committed a crime. There are many of these situations that you can imagine the things that have happened in the past are not necessarily, it's not necessarily fair in some sense that people will know it, and, but it will uh, impact your life. Okay, so back to uh, how do we define these things and how do we uh, implement them? So, uh, so this is the suggestion that you first of all go to the text of the policy of GDPR or CCPA, you extract the relevant text, you try to define it mathematically, you can analyze this mathematical definition, think about a tax that as computer scientists we would do, think about uh, methods we have, do they satisfy our, uh, our definition? And of course then you have solicit uh, legal opinion and this would be iterative. So this is kind of obvious but it's, a, it's still a recipe. Um, in the, in, the, in the particular case of right to be forgotten, uh, for example, here is a few pieces of text that appear that are relevant to this law. So there's something called, in Article 6, it lists conditions when an entity may lawfully process your data. So not just store it, but actually process it. And the data subject is given consent to the processing of his or her personal data for one or more specific purposes. Then they say, in Article 7, that he has the right to withdraw his or her consent at any time. And they don't say consent for what, but I assume it's consent for the first, where you've given your permission to, to, to process. And furthermore, uh, you have the right, uh, this is another place where it talks about the right for the erasure of personal data concerning him or her without undue delay, and the control should have the obligation to erase personal data without undue delay. And then there's another number of conditions. It leaves vague the fact of whether you also have to erase the results of processing the information. So if you're given consent, they process the information, now there's some outputs. Do they also have to erase that because it, once you ask to, uh, your, your information to be uh, erased? So all of this is vague and it brings room to a lot of interesting questions. To what extent uh, this processing, uh, the results of this processing should be erased? Uh, what, um, what we did is we have a definition here for uh, what it means to 
to be the delete data. And uh, even this definition of just deleting the data is, uh, has a lot more kind of subtleties than meets the eye because data leaves a lot of traces. So that we know that. It's not just that it's stored in one place. It's used in many places. It's linked in many ways. And um, in order to kind of moderate your expectations, <laughs> this first definition is, is, is going to be very general and simple. And it's also going to assume that the data collector is honest. He wants to be compliant. I, compliant? I said complaint. He also wants to complain. Is that the same compliant? Yeah. OK, so no, he should not complain. We should complain. In any case, the data provider uh, should, uh, he wants to be compliant. He wants to be diligent. He doesn't know how to do it. Okay, but the definition at least tells him this is what you should be sat should satisfy, and then it's a, a burden on the technicians to offer methods to to satisfy. Um, okay, and um, here's a, an example of a definition. Again, you know, it's a definition one can scrutinize afterwards. I can myself scrutinize it, but it's a first definition. It's a strong one. So, they, and this also gives you a taste of how crypto definitions look like. So here we have um, sort of the real world. So what's the real world? Uh, the reason I say the real world is not because I really mean this is the real world, but I'm going to contrast the real world with something I call the ideal world. In the real world, we have a data collector. So this is one of this company. It has some memory. Uh, there's a user. This is the one who gives, let's say, data, pi1, pi2, and later um, will ask some data uh, to be, uh, oops, ready up to here. So um, this uh, user Y, he will give data, and then he'll, he is allowed to ask the deletion of data, multiple deletions. And also there's an environment which the data collector interacts with. So there's sort of three entities here. There could be more. There could be multiple uh, users and multiple data collectors. But here there's one data collector, one environment, one a, a user. And we want to compare uh, this real world to some ideal world, where there's still these three parties. But what happened, here, and they also they have, all, they have memory, they've interacted with each other. But in this ideal world, there was never any data stored. So you wanna, there's the situation I store data and then I delete it, versus the situation I never did anything. And I want to say that you can't distinguish those two. So it leaves no trace. This is a very clean definition. It can be complicated to extend it to what you would reasonably really want. Uh, for example, uh, outputting um, processing of data to the environment. Because you, the first question you would ask, and Adi, I see is on the edge of his seat, um, is, uh, or maybe you have other questions, is that um, how could you actually do anything with this? I mean, it's it, unachievable. That's why I said that the environment is honest. And, and the environment? Oh, sorry, no, no. It's unachievable if I, go, if I told the environment uh, your information. Yes. Uh, that's right. So that's I a simple question. No, 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 it's not sophisticated. Then you, ask, you tell Google things about Shafi, and then I say I want you to delete it, but the things have already been given. Clearly, clearly, again, it's not that it's unachievable. What it means is you shouldn't say things about Shafi, and then you say, ah, that's ridiculous, okay? All right, so we've simulated everything. But the, the point is that this is, tells you that there is some burden on the data collector in what they're doing. So in other words. Uh, the question is more uh, Okay. So that is what that is exactly what I said, but I didn't word, use the word download. But Google gave me some of it. Yes, um, I didn't say that this is a, a, a definition that could be implemented tomorrow. I did, but I, I I do say that Google may be able to do maybe keep information about who asked information that they responded about you. You'd say that's unreasonable, but all I'm saying is okay. In that case, you could see an extension where. When Google gets a request that, uh, from me to delete all my information, it gives me uh, a, com a compiled list saying these are the people who, who I gave information about you. Again, I'm not. All this is, you know, the most strict definition possible and would only apply to some subset of, of tasks. But it's not an impossibility to think of an extension of this where you know who's gotten your information. We have gotten used to this world where we can find information about anybody, anytime, in huge quantities, and it's not clear that that is uh, consistent with what GDPR wants, certainly not consistent with this strong version of the definition. But it doesn't mean, yeah. So 
So authentication is very important in order to achieve these things. So you're right, that it's very important that the person who's uh, asking the deletion is, can be authenticated as, as, the, as the user who provided that information to begin with. Let's take it offline. Is that what you're asking? So these are all, these uh, are two ex students, are these not? But uh, <laughs> why don't we discuss, uh, in, so there are things, there's some obvious uh, problems with this, then there's obvious fixes, and then there's probably non-obvious problems with non-obvious fixes. But I'm, all I'm saying is that clearly uh, the data collector can do more than they're doing now in order to be compliant with data deletion, okay? And that is, to re some, in, in, in some sense, to, to give data in a different way or not to give it, okay? Because they want to be data compliant, and then they could say that could harm their services so much that the whole thing is, is not to the, they don't want to do it anymore. Um, so in any case, back just to the definition, there is sort of two places here. There's the view of the, of, the uh, of the environment in the real world. There's the memory, the state that, go that uh, the data collector has. And then the same thing can be defined in the ideal world, sort of the view and the state. And the, 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 the type of definition that we usually do in cryptography is we would say that X, this data collector, is deletion compliant if for all these environments and requesters, if you look at this state and view, it's indistinguishable in the real world and in the ideal world. This would be sort of how a cryptographer should come up with this, the first definition. And then you'd say, ah, this cannot be achieved. So notice, for example, communication here from the environment to the user is one direction. Because the user could also give it to the environment by himself. You know, people know that I went to a certain high school in Israel. You know, it's not something that they had to get from Google. So now Google is also responsible for the fact that somebody can get it. In this definition, that's, that's a more subtle problem. In this definition, the way this is eliminated, this is a one-way communication between the environment to the user. The user doesn't give things to the environment. I think it's actually good that you have objections because you realize that this is non-trivial. But that doesn't mean that it shouldn't be done. That's, I think, an important thing to realize. Um, Okay, so that's a definition. Yeah. Uh, if this in this world where you never got the data, uh, the memory should be uh, indistinguishable. So that's the state. It's part of the state. Yeah, absolutely. So actually, that is, doesn't worry me. So if you could put encrypted in such a way that there's random encryption there, that's fine. Yeah. That part actually doesn't worry me. Um, yeah. Relax version of it? That is a, that's a legal question of whether they're going to re, uh, agree that this requires compliance. I would assume that this is much more than what they intended. But of course, so that's why the, this work is in some sense in the air unless people who made the regulation would kind of swear by it. Oh, I just want to say that, you know, the immediate reaction is, ah, it's too much. But second reaction is that we actually have a bunch of methods already to achieve a lot more than what we do. So for example, if we just talk about, uh, uh, not a Google, but a data service that stores your data. Stores your data for you, uh, and then you're supposed to delete it. I don't know, it's Dropbox or, or something like that. All <laughs> oh, right, Google Docs, yeah. Um, I'm <laughs> okay, so, so um, one of the lessons from this definition is that the way that they store data can be stored in a variety of ways. So it's, let's say we take a simple data structure like a, a search tree where you store data, which is, um, and we've had, uh, a data structure usually has a, le a legitimate interface. You know, there's like, you can insert, you can delete, you can do a bunch of things, but they also have a memory representation. And the question is, what is the memory representation to be used? So actually, from cryptography years ago, it's a paper by Daniele Michiancio in 97, and then an extension of it, not extension, but the same, same notion to another data structure by Naor and Tig, where the idea is to take an existing data structure and make it into a, a history oblivious data structure. So a data structure that has the same operations, but it, a, a, instead of doing the, the operations deterministic, you have a randomized version of the data structure so that when you uh, insert, delete, uh, and so forth, you actually change, the, you have a distribution over the resulting data structures. And the property is that we say it's history oblivious if any two sequence of operations that yield the same content induce the same probability distribution on the output. So in other words, whether I've inserted something and then I deleted it, or I never inserted it, okay, the distribution on the data structure uh, is the same. So that, for example, is if you 
couldn't do this for very complicated structures. I assume that Facebook doesn't use some simple search trees. There's a social network and implement. But somebody can pay mind to it that if you wanted to extract part of it out of it, it will, the distribution of, of, the, of the internal data structures would remain the same. I think it's very, very interesting. This was designed for other purposes. But I think it has relevance in this context. Um, so in particular, we can show that it's a history of oblivious data structures plus authentication to address some of the questions that I think Zvika was referring to uh, can achieve deletion compliance when you're only doing data uh, storage. What's another set setting? So um, say that what your database is, uh, is, a re uh, is a facility that has data that researchers can approach, the usual uh, data uh, differential privacy uh, setting that researchers can approach and ask for data summaries. Right? Differential privacy actually by definition says that the outputs are going to be very, not really depend on a single entry, okay? Limits the amount of dependence on a single entry, which essentially means that if the, uh, the, the collector, in addition, because it stands to reason, not only they're supposed to uh, delete your data, maybe they're also supposed to delete summaries of, of, of your data. Here, at least, if they've used a differentially private mechanism, the summaries of the data, have no, there's no need to delete them. They, by themselves, already satisfy this deletion compliance uh, property. What's another uh, example? So let's think about machine learning. Um, so apparently, there's a f bunch of papers recently that talk about the machine learning models where you can delete uh, training data. So say that you've trained a model and, on data, and now you want to delete part of the data. Either somebody asked you to delete it, you've discovered that people, that data was false, or something like that. The question, of course, you can always retrain on the new data set. But the question is, can you do it more efficiently? So can you actually use the existing one and just uh, update it? And they have some papers suggesting how to do it. That, again, is a, a way to, uh, if you do that, plus the data oblivious for the internal data structure, points to a way, in fact, the theorem there, that, that uh, a way to represent data mach machine learning models in a way that's deletion compliant. Again, there's a, the, there's a question here, what about the output of this? I mean, you've used it in some sense. Internally used it as one thing, giving it to the environment is another thing. Okay, so all I'm saying is there are, ser there are ways, uh, at least to the things that we often talk about, data summaries, machine learning, storage uh, or information about you that can be done in a different way that might be even compliant with such a strict uh, definition. Okay. Third, um, there are lots of directions for the future on this part uh, to relax it, to make it composable. It's a big question whether it's composable across different uh, data collector uh, systems. And in, even to begin with, which deletion requests should be honored, even according to the spirit of GDPR and maybe inconsistent with something that can be achieved. I was very vague about that. What should be honored? What shouldn't be honored? What it means? Okay. I'm going to disallow services such as the archive, the internet archive, which allow you to see what was the state of the websites some time ago. Because if you are deleting the data, now it's not accessible. That's a good question. What do you think? Should it be? Should it be disallowed? No, I'm asking, should it be disallowed? <laughs> thing about this, it's a discussion in the sense that this GDPR came up. Now we're trying to codify it. It's, it's a back and forth. Uh, it's an interesting question. Should it be disallowed if it was 20 years ago? There's some time limit on it? Uh, I, I, it should be subject to this law. As, and this right. Google. And this, the point is that this is an environment, uh, well, you know, I don't want to get into these, uh, they're not details, they're reality, but uh, interesting question. Okay, so the second thing I want to talk about, which maybe is more sort of something tedious about this first part, but it's, even though it's relevant to, to the reality, is, is that I think that there's a potential of using cryptographic protocols for better legal procedures. Now this, I'm putting myself on the line there, but this point, Mark um, Patli. Uh, okay, so first of all, I, I'm talking about um, secure multi-party uh, computation, okay? So, uh, most people here all, but I don't know how many, know about it. So there's a bunch of computers that are connected through communication lines. They each have separate data, and they'd like to do, they distrust each other. They want to run arbitrary program on the aggregate data without revealing the visual data to each other. This can be done under a variety of conditions, either, um, physical channels, uh, some cryptographic assumptions. Okay, um, so we know this from the 80s, and there's a bunch of conditions, not so important. 
Um, there's even, apparently, multi-party computation has uh, grabbed the uh, attention of, of people in Senate, in the US Senate. There's a bill that uh, describes it as following. The term secure multi-party computation means a computerized system that enables different participating entities in possession of private sets of data to link and aggregate their data sets for the exclusive purpose of performing finite number of pre-approved computations without transferring or revealing any private data. So this is in English, and this is very understandable. There's a technical definition that captures it. You know, this is the, the usual definition. Let's say a bunch of hospitals, pharma companies, they want to share data because they can extract more knowledge out of it. Um, and they shouldn't give it to each other because of HIPAA, other regulations, and still they could use multi-party computation in order to access the data or to process the data. Okay, so here's, um, so we know all this. What does this have to do with law? Where is an application that has sort of a legal fl flavor to it? Okay, so here's um, a lot of words, so let me try to uh, say them. Uh, so there's this very nice paper by Mulligan and Bamberger, both from law school at Berkeley, where they point out that uh, something that people, uh, I think, in, um, some people maybe have observed elsewhere, it's within the context of a very large paper, that enforcing privacy by design. So for example, you know, there are some things called protected attributes, like race and, um, and, and things of this sort, and you're supposed by law to uh, erase it in a lot of applications, because it's not supposed, decisions are not supposed to, to depend, let's say, if you get a loan or not, on whether you are white or black or, or Asian and, and so forth. Um, and they point out that that's very nice, but in some sense, instead of doing well, good, it does harm because it allow, it makes it imp uh, impossible to tell later whether there was really unequal treatment, which may have been applied because of things like zip code, things which are not directly race, but that in, are strongly correlated with race. So saying in general, this, this, on one hand, you're trying to do good, and this is called this disparate uh, impact uh, treatment. You're not supposed to uh, treat people differently depending on certain protected attributes. But the result of it, it may ironically uh, result in, in worse, in what's called disparate impact, which you're not supposed to have. And that is things should be fair according to race and gender and all that. But on one hand, you're not allowed to look at it. On the other hand, you're allowed to have a result which uh, supposedly by not looking at it is gonna be fair. That's not the way it works, okay? So here's a proposal. How about running multi-party computation, the kind, the crypto kind, on collective uh, data, let's say my data with my gender and my race and, and so forth and all my attributes, uh, to gather information about bias and fairness of the machine learning algorithm. So in other words, there's a machine learning algorithm, it's getting inputs and it's processing it in an order, then at the end it decides whether to give me a loan, okay? Uh, if you could hide from it what the data is that they're working on, okay, but with, within the algorithm correct the fact that it would be fair, it would, in, in other words, it would be the right proportion of race and gender and whatever else it is that you want, okay, then in a sense, you have relieved the tension here, in my opinion, between disparate treatment, which is looking at that race, gender, and so forth bit, and the outcome, which is the disparate uh, uh, outcome. Of course, this is a question this is a question to the legal uh, scholars. Is that true? Is that, if you, if a multi-party computation, after all, it did look at the race bit, it did look at the gender bit, it just didn't really look at it, but it made the outcome depend on it. Would this uh, mean that uh, this does not constitute disparate treatment? Now there's probably legal scholars here, and I, my guess is you would argue one way or another way. But I see a potential here to actually circumvent a law that was intended for good intentions, but in my opinion, achieve Did I do something to the speaker? No, okay. Here's another example. Ah, this has actually been done in some sense. There's this uh, wage, uh, maybe people know about this. In BU, they did this project where they wanted to find out whether the average wage of, uh, whether the wage of, to women and men in different companies is the same, but nobody knows what the benchmarks are, uh, or is it the same across companies, so they, uh, I reached out to a whole bunch of companies in Boston, and uh, they were willing to give their data through a multi-party computation, so they didn't want to give their data to anybody, their lawyers approved this method, and they computed what the sort of average salaries are, uh, and they had a benchmark to be able to tell whether in their case they are, uh, they are above or below that benchmark. So again, it was a way to, to look at the data and not really look at it in order to provide some legal advice about salaries. Okay, so this is this one. Uh, now, what about zero knowledge? I said that that's also uh, something that could be useful. So, um, 
We know proofs. Again, this is for uh, people. I'm thinking of a proof as an interaction between a prover and, a, and someone who's verifying a proof. Um, the usual example is, is a product of two primes, n equal to pq. And how does the verifier who doesn't know how to factor integers uh, know that it's two primes? Let's say that she's very smart. She finds the two primes. Maybe she knew it to begin with. She sends him the two primes. He multiplies. But um, if we use this Hear me? Sometimes? Um, now? So let's say uh, this is uh, Adi's uh, already 1986 observation is that we can think of Alice as someone who knows some composite numbers, say, and she proves that she knows it to Bob. Um, and uh, the thing is that one way for her to prove it is just to give those two primes, but let's say Bob is target. He leaks the passwords. Then he comes out with this announcement saying, we take this matter very seriously, and we are working with law enforcement to bring these responsible to justice. Um, so the question is, can she prove to Bob that she knows these prime factors without giving them away to Bob? And that's what zero knowledge is about. So we have a way to do that. Um, so we have a way to uh, prove that Alice can prove that she knows that there is a prime P and a prime Q, such that she knows them, and therefore she is Alice, and she can buy a target freely. OK, so these are slides that really are just not new <laughs> to anybody in crypto. So I'm going to skip them. And a lot of uses have been uh, made out of these ability to prove something without giving away the classical proof. So this is zero knowledge proofs. We prove nothing except the validity. Passwords was one. <coughs> People have talked, uh, Boaz is here which uh, you can tell the story about nuclear disarmament. It's kind of a strange story about a cafeteria in Princeton. Is that right? They, some physicists heard about zero knowledge proofs, and then they thought it would be useful for nuclear disarmament. Then there's DNA uh, innocence proving, which uh, Moni, I don't know if he's here, uh, Moni Noor and, and some students also talked about but how do you check that, so, how do you prove to someone that you were not on the crime scene without giving them your DNA? So keeping your DNA private and yet proving that it's not identical in the according to the right definition of identical to, to DNA uh, on the crime scene. And going down to earth, we certainly know about validating transactions and blockchain preserving privacy anonymity. There's the Zcash company and some other companies in Kedit and so forth. Um, what about law? So if we go a little bit further, you can talk about verifying tax returns by the public, uh, uh, verifying that they're compliant with the law rules uh, without actually knowing who paid what taxes to whom. Or you could verify whether documents are privileged uh, attorney-client you know, documents. You know, this is something that apparently happens time and again. And the way that you determine if something is privileged or not is that you go and you look at the document. So it seems a little problematic to me. But um, of course, it's the only way to do it. Or is it? It isn't. We know it isn't. If you could codify how you, look with, uh, how you decide whether something is uh, privileged or not, then you could also do it in a zero knowledge way. So it would be really the intent, which is you're not supposed to look at the document in order to determine things that are based on that, uh, on that document. Um, so I think the general question is, again, how would law treat this idea that you could decouple verifying claims, verifying legal claims, without knowing the facts? So I think it took a long time also in crypto to accept it, or in complexity theory, but we kind of accepted it. But would that be acceptable to? You know, as a, as a legal, uh, is that enough of a, uh, satisfies whatever desire you have as a lawyer or a, 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 a scholar uh, to, that you believe that facts, be, the, ver the verity of facts is more important than the facts themselves. And of course, when we do this, there's a probability of error. And that's, again, something that's extremely small. We are feeling comfortable with it, because we know numerically what extremely small is. But would that be comfortable by someone who, in a legal setting? Maybe the most interesting application is this idea that you can new, have new ways to do uh, mergers and acquisitions. So this is the whole thing about how companies decide to merge, decide to acquire other companies. And a big part of that is due diligence. So a, a, a big part of that is to check what is the state of this other company, who are the customers, what's the internal uh, you know, um, IP, and so forth. And apparently, a lot of these deals do not happen because people are afraid that all is happening here is a fishing expedition. And there's a whole um, a economic theory called the theory of the firm, which says that this desire of, 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 of secrecy is what governs how 
companies in fact merge and acquire each other and why the market goes one way or another. So imagine a situation where you could do diligence in a way that keeps private information private. And this way you could mitigate those risks of disclosing information. Um, and uh, you know, I know there's NDAs, but apparently even those people don't respect and then suing someone for not respecting NDA has a cost in itself. I think that's a very interesting question. If you could do it, what would it mean to this whole economic theory of the, of the firm? So again, you know, I, I'm allowing myself, given to my age, to say, put this out there, but I don't think it's without basis. Proving the fact that your idea is worthwhile or something. Absolutely. So I think all these things have, uh, I think it has potential. The whole question, of course, is if you can codify these things that you do now by looking at the document into something that a computer does. As soon as you do that, then the barrier really is just uh, implementing the zero knowledge, but we don't have any, sort of, I think the fundamental barrier is how do you write this down as an, as an algorithm. Okay, so I'm, uh, I don't know what time it is. Uh, Okay, so the last thing that I want to talk about is uh, this case in point, um, and that is sort of uh, something that we've done. Uh, so as you know, there is this uh, Foreign Intelligence uh, uh, Security Act, which uh, allows the U.S. government to, to uh, <coughs> do surveillance on foreign nationals, and apparently there's lots of them issued every year, but there's also the federal, the federal uh, laws, which means that you can also inside the US, uh, do surveillance on, on US citizens, or what you need to do is go to uh, a judge and uh, get a warrant. You know, if you have to put, and then the, the, you take the warrant, there's a law enforcement agency, FBI, goes to the judge, asks for the warrant, gives it the warrant, goes to the company, asks for the data, the company may challenge this with the judge, but let's say at the end, <coughs> it has to, so it gives, uh, gives the, your emails or whatever data has been requested. And, um, and uh, the secrecy, of course, of these investigations is key. Otherwise, there's no point in it. So you're asking surveillance, and then everybody knows about it, then I guess you don't talk. Uh, although, you know, everybody with all those uh, machines around their house, they talk freely. So it's unclear that even if you know that you're being surveilled, that you, that you change anything. But, you know, uh, so there are these uh, laws. They're sealing a case, preventing court records from becoming accessible to the general public. That's what sealing case means. There's something called a gag order that you can't even say that an order exists, uh, mentioning it to others. So there are, there's a body of law that governs the fact that you're not supposed to disclose that an investigation is going on. And uh, what this judge, Judge Smith from Texas, uh, he wrote a bunch of papers because he, he noticed that it turns out there's also a law that says that after, after the investigation is over 30 days or something, you, you are supposed to lift the gag order, lift the secrecy order so that the public has available, you know, uh, knows that there was an order. It can sort of assess the magnitude of how much surveillance is being done. But it turns out that it's very rare that a judge lifts it. So there's a lot of these cases sitting under gag order, nobody, because there has to be an act to lift it. It doesn't happen automatically. And it shouldn't happen automatically. You don't want by mistake to, to kind of reveal everything. So he has these papers, gagged, sealed, and, and delivered, reforming. And, and, and his solution was, um, so first of all, why is it a problem? So he says it's a problem because the law is that they're supposed to open it. But not only because they don't obey the law, but they're claiming that, uh, he's saying that, the only way to change law in the US is to have sort of appellate guidance and to, to kind of know what's going on, and then you could sort of uh, challenge it. And there is no way to do that because nobody knows about it. 
public doesn't know about it, uh, the only affected party doesn't know about it, and, th and that's the problem with not opening it up to scrutiny. And then uh, his uh, suggestion was, um, oh, I just want to know that it's not completely true what I just said. Google, Facebook, M and Microsoft, and so forth, they do publish reports similar to the report that you mentioned, but uh, you mentioned financial, uh, reports that talk about how much surveillance they were, requ uh, the uh, requests they got and, and what they said. But they don't, but there's no re way to know whether this is the right numbers. There's no way to know what type of, why they were asked, okay, to, for surveillance, whether they, it, it did anybody any good, and uh, what type of surveillance. Was it racist, what is, was it partial? And um, basically, so also in Israel, uh, you, <laughs> uh, okay, and apparently um, this is sort of an overview of uh, the cases and how it's been going up in terms of how much surveillance has been requested on your digital information. So his proposal, the judge, uh, was to have a cover page. So each one of these cases would have a cover page, and the cover page will, will have some meta, metadata about a sealed case, and that should always be made public. As you're giving the warrant, you, there's a publication that says there is a, there is a case that's going on, and some information on that cover page. There's a clear tension here is what do you put on the cover page? What do you prove? You, you just do uh, an X? <laughs> I mean, what information do you put there? And there's a clear tension here between privacy and accountability. That's obvious. So uh, it's kind of like obvious that what we know how to do is relevant in order to do accountability. So what, what we did is we sort of came up with a system uh, which offers sort of accountability and privacy at the same time. So and uh, it, it, it uses the kitchen sink, you know, zero knowledge and multi-party computation and even public ledgers because this is a notion of time that it has to expire uh, and what happened before what um, and essentially public now can uh, check that each participant in this triangle <laughs> perform their job properly and lawfully. And also, can, can we, a part of the multi-party computation aspect of this is to do aggregate <laughs> statistics over all the court orders. So here's kind of what the system looks like. Sorry, that's the threat model. And that is that there are these judges, many of them, and they're giving warrants you know, like hotcakes. Um, or <laughs> So, so what? And, uh, and the thing is that you know, multi-party computation is very nice as a concept, but it does cost. So if the, all these judges were doing multi-party computation together, you know, not, not so good. Anyway, the judge, judicial system is overworked. But there is a, apparently in the judicial system in the US, there is a hierarchical um, so there are these district courts, there's 12 of them, and the idea was that they, they, there's something called hierarchical multi-party computation where the people in the bottom, they're, sent, they're sort of splitting their decisions, they're giving it to these uh, middle courts, and they will do multi-party computation where they aggregate the information, and they talk about how many of requests were, how many of them were for one purpose, for another purpose, maybe just threshold. It was a bigger, you know, than 100, was it bigger than 1,000, uh, what state were they in, and, and, and so forth. So, uh, of course, there's a question here, definitions, like I said before, who are, who are, what's the threat model, really? I mean, the judges, I guess, are honest, but forgetful. The law enforcement might be malicious, the companies might be malicious, the public might be malicious, and you want this protocol to work within this threat, uh, threat model. But in some sense, this is engineering. I mean, once you have the intent and we have all the tools, you have to put it together correctly and prove it uh, to, to achieve this accountability. So, I think I've, um, yeah, some, uh, data, obviously, I didn't make these graphs, my students. Uh, so th this is uh, Jonathan Franco, Sanu Park, Daniel Schall, and then it was me and, and Danny Weitzner on the sort of a professor side. Um, we did show it to this Judge Smith, and he, uh, he was very happy. He said, my hope is the court administrators will embrace the possibility of enhancing public oversight. Uh, the lessons uh, learned here will smooth the way toward greater accountability. Now, he's very... Um, um, I think for, um, eh, I don't know the word. He, he no, oh, um, he's a very enlightened judge. Just being a judge eh, is not equivalent. So, so, so apparently he's shown at the committee of people who are responsible for this and they uh, rejected it out immediately because they said uh, if it's not 
broken, why fix it? And it's, it's too much of a headache, and there'll be software <laughs> bugs. And I agree about the third. Uh, What's the third? There'll be software bugs. Software bugs. So software bugs is always a uh, complaint, which has great grave truth to it. So they are like as also. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. But I think this is also a conservative bunch, and, and, and rightfully so. So it moves slowly. So just the fact that they rejected it immediately the first time doesn't mean that there isn't something here that can be accepted. Um, OK, so there's also, I just want to say a word, that there's this first uh, thing I talked about, the foreign uh, intelligence. And there, there's something called a body of secret laws. It's not exactly a law. It's regulation where you don't even know what the reason is, what the law is according to which the judge or this court authorizes surveillance. But even here, we know in principle what to do with zero knowledge. So there's a secret law, and there's a secret order, and you have to show that they're consistent with each other. So I'm saying even when the process itself, the rules themselves are, are not necessarily uh, public, <coughs> imagine that the, the technology that we have in principle, mathematically speaking, can handle it. So I just want to end. Um, there are lots of other scenarios. You know. Um, there's some examples out here about violation of contract with secret laws. Uh, you want to check that they, uh, that whether the contract was honored or violated, even without finding out what the secret clauses are. Uh, litigation, which is uh, could be very harmful to the person who gets uh, charged. Um, and I want to say that uh, and this is a shout out to a workshop that we're going to have, which Simon's on on algorithms in the law, organized by. A bunch of Michals and Inbal, um, and um, uh, Elkins Cohen, Feldman, and Talgum Cohen, and um, that it's not just about privacy. That's my expertise, and that's why this whole lecture is about privacy or, or cryptography. But there are other, um, you know, societal values besides privacy, fairness, freedom of speech. And on one hand, there is a sort of a mathematical formulation that we have come up with, uh, maybe in cryptography. Maybe we should modify it. And then there's the legal doctrine that governs it, like the right to privacy, anti-discrimination, duty of care, copyright. And there's an interesting question in all of these things. Uh, what is the algorithmic task in order to satisfy the, le the legal doctrine? How do you mathematically formulate it, which is consistent with the legal doctrine? I think it's, uh, it's, it's fascinating. <coughs> Thank you.